If there is one thing every good investigator has to offer, it's follow the evidence. Making assumptions can be easy when looking into how cases and events unfold. In the story of the murder of Julie Kibuishi, it's very easy to prematurely draw conclusions. So, here are the facts as it all played out on how she was murdered in cold blood. My name's Ben. And I'm Nicole, and you're listening to Wicked and Grim. A true crime podcast. I think we got the video figured out this time. Fingers crossed. I think we said it last time, but uh, I think this time, third time's a charm. Third time is a charm. We're having some technical difficulties behind the scenes. And I think we were trying to overcomplicate things with like a bunch of camera and different angles. And in our tiny home, just having multiple cameras doesn't work too well. Yeah. So I think we're going to go with a main camera and just kind of like crop and go back and forth. It'll still be 4K. It'll still be awesome, but uh, just not quite as elaborate, but it'll be done. It'll be awesome. It'll be there. And we might get there, right, where we have more cameras. But, I mean, sometimes it's just better to start simple. Exactly. Like I say, overcomplicating it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we got it. It's rolling. It'll be on YouTube uh, in the days to follow of this release. Awesome. The link is down below if you want it. It's there. If not, you can keep listening to us here. There you go. Um, Or, or, or. You can listen on Patreon. That's true. Because the link is down there too. And we have some awesome people who signed up this week. Um, For example, we have Lane Page and Callum who both signed up and are getting that behind the scenes, the exclusive episodes at the end of the month, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love it. What I don't love is that it snowed today or last night. Well, I mean. Didn't snow a lot. We're overdue. Yeah. But it caused me to like have a very dramatic slip and fall in the driveway. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. That was that was something. <laughs> coffee was spilt, you know. Well, I had my Yeti coffee mug and as I was walking, I like slipped and then my back gave out and in that moment I just accepted I'm not catching myself. I'm dropping. And I literally dropped my coffee and I just prepared to catch myself and I hit the ground. <laughs> And I laid there uh, for a good minute. Yeah, you were just laying there and your coffee's just like spilling onto the road. So I grabbed that, but I didn't really know if I should help you up. So I just <laughs> let you lay there. It was, it was quite a sight, actually. I left a really good impression in the snow. When you're driving by, you're like, yeah, someone fell right there. You yeah, can see who it. was drinking a coffee. <laughs> yeah, or tried to, be, but instead it hit the road instead. Yeah. Anyways, uh, you ready for this case? Yeah. This one's got a twist, a turn, a roller coaster kind of aspect to it. So very much so, I want you to consider the intro that we went over. Okay. Do not come to conclusions. Okay. Take the evidence into account because evidence is everything, right? Okay. Yeah. It's sometimes hard though to cut, like you, people just do come to conclusions and then they're oh, definitely. so set on, on that and- it doesn't take much to convince them yeah. otherwise. So this is good. Okay. I'm so, going to just look at the evidence. So if you're listening, I want you to play along in that sort of game aspect. Don't get me wrong. This is this is a murder. This isn't a game. Someone lost their freaking life and it's tragic. But I want you to try and put your shoes in the investigator, investigative side. Do not come to those conclusions. Try and follow the clues and see what you can come up with before we really give the okay. the answers. Okay? So we're our own investigator. Yes, in, in a sense. In a sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this all starts off on a Monday. It's May 21st in 2012. Stephen and Raquel Hare became a little concerned about their son. Now their son, Sam, was supposed to go to his parents' house on the weekend for a visit, whether it was dinner or whatever, but he never showed up. His parents tried to get a hold of him, but None of their efforts were successful. His phone kept going straight to voicemail, which was rather unusual, especially for being on the weekend when he was much more available. Mm -hmm. So they decided he needed, or they needed to check in on him. Something, I mean, of course, could be wrong. Is he okay or whatever, right? So they went to check in on their 26-year-old son, Sam, when they arrived and knocked at his door. No one answered. From there, they let themselves in. And they took a look around Sam's apartment. They they had a spare key, so they opened the door, right? And they were inside calling out to their son, Sam, Sam, it's your parents, you home, you okay? 
just making their presence known sort of thing, right? Well, yeah, so they don't startle him. Yeah, I mean, what if he's just getting out of the shower or something? Yeah. Right? No one wants to see their their child like that. So, I mean, hey, I'm here. You know, presence being <laughs> known is, is important. Uh, but from there, uh, they continue looking around. Now, I mean, mind you, his apartment was is rather clean. It's typical bachelor pad, mind you, uh, as well. But there's like the odd empty beer can here or there. Living room had a sectional couch facing, facing towards a nice big screen TV and an acoustic guitar sitting next to it as well. Uh, nothing was out of the ordinary. It was relatively clean, nice, just kind of bachelor paddy, right? Okay. So they're looking around and they managed to make their way over to the bedroom. And once they got to the bedroom, Steve Hare opened the door and this is where he was met with a very gruesome sight. He found a woman dead in the room, leaning over the bed, and he immediately called 911. Holy shit. Steve told the operator on 911, quote, there's a body in my son's apartment. Looks like there's been some sexual activity. She's dead. There's blood from her head. Huh. Okay. So the unknown woman was found laying face down, lifeless, with blood coming from a bullet wound from the back of her head. She wore a tiara on her head and her jeans appeared to be cut, ripped or whatever the case, but were pulled down around her knees. Someone had appeared to also have written, quote, all yours and fuck you across the back of her sweatshirt. Huh. Okay. I would not have a clue what to think. No? No. I mean, okay. Being that you're a parent and like, I think you would think your, your kid could could do no wrong kind of thing. Most parents would think that, right? Okay, yeah. I would probably be worried for my son thinking that, shit, like, where is he? Is he safe or is he, did someone take him or is he killed or like dead somewhere, you know? Like, I think that's probably where my head would go. That's where your head would go? Yeah. Okay. Well, for police, they, of course, immediately began working on the case and scouring the apartment for clues. But it's no surprise for them or for to say really that Sam to them became suspect number one. Yeah, right? I could see that too, for sure. So Detective Jose Morales and Lieutenant Ed Everett of the Cosa Mesa Police Department believed that Sam's familiarity with firearms due to his military background, coupled with potential impact of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD from his service, may have contributed to a moment of crisis or snapping. So Sam pretty much left his parents wondering, Sam, what did you do? Mm -hmm. Now, the only problem is they had no idea where Sam had gone. They were left with a body and the search for Sam began. Well, because also the other thing I'm just going to bring up to that seemed confusing is the message on the back of her hoodie. Definitely. Because that to me almost seems like she's being left there for Sam in a sense, maybe. Maybe. So. Well, let's talk about Sam for a minute. Let's go into his background, who he is. So 26-year-old Sam Hare was an army veteran and a student at Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa. So this is in California. Okay. Sam was previously deployed for duty in Afghanistan and had eventually returned home to begin his studies. At school, he was beginning a new career path and was making a lot of new friends along the way. He was a bit of a social butterfly, easily liked by people, and just a really happy-go-lucky guy making lots of friends, right? One friend that he made was that of 23-year-old Julie Kibuishi. Now, Julie described Sam to her mom as a fun and responsible guy. The 26-year-old veteran started college after returning home from this Afghanistan fight, and he's known to all these fellow students, just like Julie, as a fun and responsible guy. Julie, in fact, even described Sam as a big teddy bear, who was also, quote, always nice to everybody. Aw. Yeah. Okay, that's like awesome descriptions. It is. Now, the only problem is, though, Julie was soon identified as the deceased woman in Sam's apartment. Oh, shit. Yeah. So the quotes that I just offered uh, came secondhand from Julie's mother. Dang. Okay. Yeah. So Sam and Julie had been close for a while. They were good friends with a pseudo brother and sister type relationship, given how close they were. Sam even told his father at one point that Julie was like his, quote, kid sister when he was asked about the relationship. So the dad's all like, hey, you know, what's going on with you and mm -hmm. Julie, right? And mm -hmm. Sam's just like, no, she's like my kid sister, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's nothing going on. We're just good friends, really close. So 
And now Julie had actually even been tutoring and helping Sam for an anthropology class at school. So not only were they friends, not only were they this pseudo brother, sister type relationship, but she was also a bit of a mentor to him in, in certain aspects, helping tutor him. Right. Okay. So their relationship was all over the place in a very well-rounded way. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is really healthy for a lot of people to have those sort of things, connections in various matters. So. Yeah. It's like you're chosen family at a different, like as in your adult life, you know? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Now, as investigators began digging into the relationship between Julie and Sam, they began uncovering some intriguing details. On the evening of May 21st, 2010, Julie was at a dinner date with her brother. While they were enjoying their time, she began receiving some text messages from Sam. Now, the text from Sam goes as this, quote, can you come over tonight at midnight alone? Going out for a bit, very upset, need to talk. Please, no sex, I need to talk to someone. Julie responded, LOL, ew Sam, we're like bro and sis, no sex. The, te <laughs> the text messages continue and Sam told Julie about how he was, quote, hurting because some bad family crap and he didn't want to be alone. To which Julie responded, quote, yeah, that's fine. Sam, I'm here for you like family. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So during the dinner with her brother, Julie received not only these texts, but also a tiara as a gift from uh, her brother to be in her wedding party. To be oh, in his okay. wedding party, sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's cute. So he's getting married and I'm not too sure what position she was asked to be, whether it's like maid of honor or a bridesmaid or maybe on his side and yeah. whatever the case, but she's getting this tiara in the term of asking to be in the party, right? Oh, that's adorable. Yeah. To which she clearly accepted because she donned the tiara quite quickly. She wore it on top of her head and the night continued. They finished their evening together and after Julie um, went over to Sam's place, still wearing the tiara on top of her head. It would be the next morning that Julie's mother woke up to find her daughter had never returned home and contacted the police. The investigation unfolding and the story slowly began to unravel itself. Authorities also discovered an interesting detail about Sam. He may have been a veteran, but he also had a criminal history. One thing I realized that I actually didn't mention yet is the tiara that she was wearing. She was still wearing it when her deceased remains were found. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did mention. I did? Okay. Yeah, okay. gosh, which is sad. It is. So at 18, Sam had faced allegations of leading a man to a parking lot where he was brutally attacked and killed by a group of men in what police deemed a gang-related incident. Although some of the accused were convicted and received life sentences for the event, Sam was declared not guilty. Determined to turn his life around, he subsequently enlisted in the army. Okay. Yeah. One thing I just want to state that seems kind of odd is is that text message. The text message? In a sense, because I'm almost now wondering if that was even Sam because you describe the relationship as siblings. So the fact that he's inviting her over and then like states no sex seems like odd. Yeah. Unless you, maybe they've had previously have said things and it's like a joke or something. Yeah. But. Did you want me to go back and read those texts again? No. So you can reevaluate? No? Okay. I don't think so. <clears throat> no? Okay. I just, now I'm just, it just popped in my head. The no sex thing is, might be odd considering that they are like brother and sister potentially. Yeah. Yeah, no, very good point. Yeah. I'm not giving you any details. No, you're really you got not. got a good point. <laughs> now, locating Sam, of course, posed a significant challenge. He was gone. His apartment was empty other than, of course, his belongings and uh, Julie's remains. Uh, and for a while, there was no trace of him. He seemed to have just vanished and his vehicle was gone as well. Now, the breakthrough in the case came unexpectedly, leading the police investigation in a surprising new direction. The police had dug into Sam's bank history to see if any of his cards had been used, right? This would provide them with a bit of a, a map of where he might yeah. be if he's using them. Now, in doing so, they managed to discover Sam's bank card had been used at a nearby ATM and later that same day at a pizza parlor. They huh. quickly approached the establishments, got the security camera footage, and when they reviewed it, they saw a person using his card. It was not Sam. Oh, shit. Okay. 
Oh, I mean, shit. Okay, that's well, your response. I was just going to say, I don't know. I was on this pizza thing because I was like, that's so random if you like murder someone and then like want some pizza. But then also, I don't think that's totally abnormal with some of the cases we've covered. People do weird shit and then go and eat food. Yeah. Eat food. Well, there, there's cases where people have like murdered their entire family or whatever. And then they're just sitting there eating a pint of ice cream on the couch. Like, uh, an hour later, right. Yeah. But I mean, also food is comfort in a sense too, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. So. Uh, now an employee at the pizza place believed he recognized the person using the card as a local teenager and provided the police with the address of said teenager. Okay. So they took swift action and the police approached and surrounded the address at a Long Beach residence. They suspected Sam might be actually hiding with assistance of someone else. To their surprise, they didn't find Sam at all inside, though, but instead encountered Wesley Freelich, the teenager from the surveillance video, which was found at the ATM and then also the person they described at the pizza parlor. So Wesley explained to police that he had been approached by his former theater mentor and that man was Dan Wozniak. Now, Dan claimed to be working for a bail bond agency and requested Wesley to withdraw money using the ATM card. According to Dan, the card owner had skipped out on bail, necessitating a financial transaction. So he's like, hey, he skipped out on his bail. We need money from his account. I, you know, his bail bond agents, officer, whatever the case, I'm working with the agency. Here's his card. Go get some money for me if you wouldn't mind. And to quote Wesley exactly, quote, he showed me paperwork. It looked legit. It looked like federal police paperwork. So I assumed that he was good. He wasn't lying to me and I trusted him. Hmm. Did he also tell him to go and get use the card for pizza? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> maybe he just know. did that on his own. I'm not sure. I feel like anyone that just randomly gave me a card and asked me to go do that. I don't think I would. Yeah. It's a bit of a red flag. Like even you, I'd be like, yeah. what the fuck did you do? <laughs> but in this case, he had this paperwork that looked very legit from a federal agency. So federal paperwork, right? Yeah. And so this is a person that he already had a, uh, a relationship with, right? He already knew this guy previously. So now everything about the situation changed the perspective of police officers. It changed the idea of where Sam could be because now they really had no idea. Where uh -huh. if someone else has his card, that could change things a lot. Why did this guy have his card? And who was Dan Wozniak? So the police faced the task of uncovering how Dan, a well-regarded actor in the local theater community, had come into possession of Sam's bank card. Dan and his fiancée, Raquel Buffett, who was also an actress, resided in the same apartment complex as Sam. Okay. Lo and behold. Can I ask a stupid question? You can. Was that paperwork fake? We'll get into oh, stuff. Okay, you're I'm not really, giving anything you're not away. Giving anything away. <clears throat> the information I give away is what I've got scripted here. <sighs> We're gonna go over it. No fun. No. Okay, well, where's your head at? <laughs> I right know now? it's okay. Keep going. What are you thinking? What What's your head at right now? Well, I was just curious if I'm assuming. Like I thought it was kind of a dumb question, but I'm assuming that paperwork was fake. And, but I just wanted confirmation, but that's okay. Well, we'll touch on it that's here. That's okay. We're almost there. Okay. Okay. So what had happened was during the investigation, because Dan lives in the same complex as Sam, mm -hmm. the police had already interviewed Sam as one of the neighbors who might've heard something or seen something suspicious, right? Oh, interviewed Dan. Or sorry, Dan. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. In Sam's apartment complex, yeah. they interviewed Dan as a neighbor. My mistake. Sorry. So they actually interviewed Dan and his fiance, Raquel. Now, in their previous conversations, both Dan and Raquel claimed to not have seen Sam since Friday when they observed him walking with another man sporting a black hat. The police determined to get answers quickly went back and apprehended Dan and questioned him during his bachelor party. Reportedly, as soon as police um, stormed in to get him during his bachelor party, uh, visibly the blood drained from his face and he just went pale. Hmm. So Dan caved and confessed to police right away about having Sam's bank card, saying that it was because the two planned a small insurance scheme that they had together. He was going to drain Sam's bank account, and Sam was going to claim credit card theft. However, Sam, apparently in a drug-induced state, 
revealed to him that he had killed Julie before they could profit from any of it. Oh my gosh. Okay. This is getting, this is getting hard to follow. Well, not hard to follow, but just like shit. Yeah. So this was a scheme that they were reportedly running together. So yes, the paperwork was fake. Huh. Because they were going to commit credit card fraud is what he's yeah. saying. And Dan didn't want to be the one that was seen withdrawing the money. Correct. So then he asked this other dude. Correct. Which he probably like, go buy yourself a pizza for drawing the money out or something like that. Is probably how it went, right? Yeah. Buy yourself some lunch and withdraw this money for me. Yeah. It's funny because before this, I was just like, I would never do that. But then I was like, oh, if I get a pizza, maybe I, <laughs> maybe I would. <laughs> that changes the whole thing. <laughs> it does actually, which is so brutal. Yep. <laughs> um, so Dan now explained how Sam was now on the run and how Sam had actually threatened Dan to keeping his mouth shut about this murder. To quote Dan, quote, he's like, you rat me out. I'm going to fucking kill you. And better yet, I'm going to start with your wife. Hmm. So Dan was arrested at his bachelor party. He's getting married within like 48 hours. Oh, so his wedding okay. is like coming Gosh, real soon. shit. That's yep. exactly what you need right before your wedding. Right. So Dan continued divulging details to investigators. Initially, he said that he had left Sam at a shopping center parking lot and disposed of Sam's car, maintaining he didn't know anything about Sam's whereabouts. However, investigators decided something wasn't quite right. They weren't getting all the information. So they used a tactic about trying to divulge or to get some more information divulged to them. They took a DNA sample from Dan. Okay. Saying that we have DNA from you. We're going to see if we can match it up with crime scene DNA. Right. Right. As soon as that happened, Dan altered his narrative a bit. He admitted to being inside Sam's apartment and he claimed to have seen Julie's lifeless body, which could potentially be why his DNA might be there. Yeah. But he persisted. He did not know where Sam was. Oh, gosh. Okay. I don't even know what to think at this point, but okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just kind of like reveling in this here. Well, you are because this is just, I don't <clears throat> know. I bet you anything too, especially what I think is it's going to be like the opposite. Okay. Well, what do you think? I'm oh curious. Oh my gosh. You don't have, if you don't want to, that's fine. We can just keep going. Right now, I feel like I'm thinking that Dan is the bad guy. Okay. And that like Sam is either is in jeopardy or, or, I don't even know how to word it, but no, right now I feel like Sam is, is not the bad guy and Dan is. Okay. Is where my head's at, but okay. I'm still very much so processing. You're not sure in the details, but you're sure Dan is bad. Sam is somewhere. At right now. Okay. Yeah, at this point in time. Yeah. Okay. Well, to officers, it seemed like Dan might've been nervous about, of course, them finding his DNA, which is why he confessed so easily when they did take that sample. Right. Otherwise, why would he divulge this new information? Yeah. So suspicions regarding Dan obviously quickly rose, and for good reason. Dan Wozniak was born on March 23rd, 1984. Let's get into his history a bit. He was a 38-year-old at the time and had two older brothers who spent much of his time, and he spent much of his time, sorry, in his younger years with his grandparents after school. Now, Dan's parents worked very hard, very long hours, which is why yeah. he would go to his grandparents, right? Yep. And as a result, their family had a very beautiful home and could afford frequent and expensive vacations. They, they had some money. Growing up, Dan was a good kid who got pretty good grades. He quickly found himself drawn to theater and arts. He was very charismatic and soon paved his way into his future career within the theater. Now, outside of his acting aspirations, because he wasn't making much money, if at all, at the theater, he couldn't really hold a job for long, and he bounced around a lot. Still... No matter where he found himself, he kept his dream alive for acting, which brings him to where he was now at a community theater as an actor. Dan was beginning to fall apart during his interview with police. He was getting married within the next 48 hours, and he had a lot at stake right now. He came to the point where he decided he wasn't going to talk any longer. He said enough, he was done. But that's when police doubled down. They threatened to arrest him for accessory to murder, 
something I'm not sure if they had even enough to do with his confession or anything so far by even being in the room of the body. I'm not certain they might have, but I'm going to assume this was a bluff. Whatever the case, whether a bluff or not, it seemed to work. Dan kept talking and police pushed more. They made another bluff. They said they found his DNA. They had a match now. Something that Dan didn't protest to. He did, though, make a statement about standing over her body at one point and mentioned two gunshot wounds to the back of her head. This was a piece of information that wasn't known to public or even police. Oh, boy. In fact, it took an autopsy to figure out there were two bullet wounds to the back of Julie's head. To the naked eye, it only looked like one. Holy shit. Huh. Him having knowledge of this information meant he was present at the murder. Yeah. Whether he pulled the trigger or not, he was at least there. He knew two shots were fired. And police could now officially wow. arrest him as an accomplice. Well, also, I feel like prior to, they could have held him in a sense because like he knew that this this murder had happened and there was like a dead body somewhere and like didn't contact the police. Isn't that, in a sense, that's pretty bad, isn't it? Well, I mean, definitely. And I'm just saying like when I said it could have been a bluff, like I was just assuming the Well, worst, yeah, right? but I'm just, I'm just brainstorming. I feel like they could have kept him anyway, but wow, that wedding ain't happening. Don't think so. So Dan confessed to detectives and told them all he knew about the murder of Julie Kibuishi. And he tried to frame Sam for it. And he did so after he murdered Sam. So Sam is no longer. Nope. Holy shit. Okay, this, this is not good. This all happened after he was behind bars for only approximately 14 hours before he started his full confession. So he's saying Sam murdered Julie, but then he murdered Sam. <clears throat> Dan murdered Julie. Oh. After murdering Sam. And he did so, he murdered Julie to try and frame Sam for it. Okay. I'll, I'll explain here. Don't worry. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, I know you will, but wow. Okay. So authorities were meant to think Sam was on the run and they were never going to find him. So there was a murder of Sam. We'll get into why. And then afterwards, he killed Julie to try and pin Julie's murder on Sam and explain mm. why Sam is missing. Because now he's on the run, maybe fled the country. We'll never find him because he's the murderer. Meanwhile, he's not. He's actually dead. So it was a red herring. Wow. Jeez. Okay. <clears throat> so regarding it all, in Dan's words, quote, I'm crazy and I did it. I killed Julie and I killed Sam. Holy shit. It sure didn't take him very long though. Like this is just like spiraling. Yeah. But I did call that. You did. I did. So good job. Yep. Um, also on the text messages too, but we'll touch on that shortly. Oh, so I should probably be a detective. You probably should. <laughs> so Sam was, as I mentioned earlier, a well-liked guy and he had, you know, a lot of friends. He was a social butterfly and he had befriended Dan over time. At one point their conversa in their conversations, it had come up that San had a good chunk of savings in his account. $62,000 in combat pay from his time in service with the military. This got Dan's attention. He may have been active at his local theater, but he certainly did not have a job. With no income, Dan had a lot of financial trouble. He was getting deeper and deeper into debt, facing eviction soon even. And he was getting married in only a few days, which costs a lot, plus an extravagant honeymoon all on top of it all. In that moment, Dan saw a solution to his problems. Wow. He was going to kill Sam and take his money. Holy shit. That is brutal. Yeah. The only thing though that had at one point, you, I think you had said Dan's family has money. Correct. So that's why I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe it's not Dan because like his family is well off or whatever, but that doesn't necessarily mean like the kid can have money. But he's used to having money, growing up mm -hmm. with money, right? And now he doesn't. Yeah. Which is just, God, Sam earned that money. Like that's. Right. 
brutal. It's and they, and he thought they were friends. Like it makes you think twice, kind of like who you can totally trust, right? I'll just wait till you hear how exactly it played out. Oh gosh, okay. So Dan had lured Sam to the attic of a nearby theater by asking him to help move some stuff, one of which was a couch. Now, in his words, quote, I said, you need to bend down and help me lift this thing up. And when he bent down, I grabbed the gun and I shot him. One shot wasn't enough to kill Sam, though. After he had pulled the trigger, Sam was still alive, but Sam didn't know what happened. Again, in Dan's words, he said, I need help. Something hit me. It felt like an electric shock. I reloaded and I fired again. Oh my gosh. So Dan shot him and Sam was calling out to him for help. And Dan shot him again. Wow. Okay. That, and cause like he, Sam could not comprehend that Dan would hurt him. Yeah. He, like there was no question in his mind. No question that Dan was the source of the pain. Oh, holy shit. That just made my heart like drop. I could sob right now, but I'm going to hold, I'm going to try holding it together. But my eyes are watering. Wow. That is so sad. That's fucked. Holy shit. Yeah. Okay. Dan's a piece of shit. Wow. Wow. <laughs> okay. So he continued his story and told police how he then disemboweled Sam's body and deep disposed of him in El Dorado Park in Long Beach, California. With this inf information from Dan, police began a search for his remains. Sam's decapitated head was discovered on what would have been his 27th birthday. It would be just two hours after Dan performed in the musical Nine on stage that he would turn his attention to Julie Kibuishi. Using Sam's phone, Dan lured Julie to his apartment through text messages, where the very same ones that we read earlier. And yes, you're right. I don't think Sam would have ever said anything about sex, but Dan didn't know otherwise. Mm. So these are Sam's words regarding what happened when she arrived. Quote, Julie was wearing like a crown tiara. She had just come from her brother's. And I said, like, Sam just called me and he's going through some stuff. She said, yeah, me too. I said, well, I have a key. Let's go in. And then I said, oh, by the way, did you see this on Sam's bed? Lean over, look at it right there. When she was leaned over, I put two bullets in the back of her head. Holy shit. This guy's a... F oh. Yeah. Piece of work. Wow. Now, I was unable to find any comments from Dan regarding why her genes were removed. Well, yeah, I was just going to be asking this because didn't the parents say it looked like sexual activity had happened? Yeah. But according to prosecutors, Dan then, quote, desecrated her body, pulling her pants down to make it look like Sam had raped her. Now, the exact reasoning for the word, the use of the word desecration, I'm unaware of, but there could be many assumptions on what played out in that aspect. It would be on December 16th, 2015, when a jury convicted Dan Wozniak of two counts of first degree murder. Following this verdict, a California judge sends him to death during a hearing in September of 2016, placing him on death row. At the sentencing hearing, the parents of the victims were given the opportunity to confront him. One of the things Sam's dad said, Steve Hare, quote, my only regret is this state won't let me kill this coward myself. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I honestly don't blame, blame that statement from him whatsoever. Julie's mother, June Kibuishi said this, you took my daughter's beautiful, caring, loving daughter's precious life to cover up your heinous and planned crimes. Did I ever see any remorse? No, not even once. Oh boy, man, just that's like this, the spiral effect too of the, the damage caused, right? Yep. Like you take two people's lives, but it's just affecting so many more people and changing their lives and making them worse. And well, ugh. he killed Sam for $62,000 and then he killed Julie to cover up Sam's death. So he placed a value 
of $31,000 on each life. Yeah. Now, despite his sentencing in 2019, California Governor Gavin Newsom, sorry, implemented a moratorium on the death penalty in the state. As a result, over 700 inmates on death row, including Dan Wozniak, are not currently facing execution. In November of 2018, a different jury found Raquel Buffett, Dan's girlfriend or fiance. Yeah, I was going to ask about her. Guilty of being an accessory after the fact. She was accused of lying to investigators to protect Dan. She was subsequently sentenced to 32 months in jail. Holy shit. So did she know about it or just find out about it after? I wonder. I don't know for sure. Wow. Okay. Because if she found about it, found out about it after. Well, I mean, she was guilty of being an accessory after the fact. So my assumption is she found about out about it after. Gosh, could you imagine if you found out like this man that you're about to marry is like cold blooded killer? I feel like I'd just be like, "Fuck you." Peace. <laughs> no like, kidding. I like dodged a bullet kind of here by I'm not marrying you. Well, by the sounds of it, she's like, "You did what? Wait, you got how much money?" Oh, that's kind of what it seems like to me. Gross. So I think they are uh, two peas in a pod. Yikes. Okay. So that is the story of the death and murder of Julie Kibuishi and Sam Hare. And the title of this episode is actually the, it can be the murder of Julie Kibuishi, um, strictly to, to keep the, the story okay. intact here, but yeah. it is certainly the two of them. Yeah, because that was something, too, during this that I was almost like, well, you were just saying that it was a murder of Julie. So, like, that made me kind of question Sam a little bit, too. But Well, I didn't want to give the, the whole story away, well, right? Well, no, it makes sense. Yeah. But, yeah, because the the whole idea is at the beginning, everyone right away, Sam did some shit, right? And if, I didn't think that, though. No, really. Well, I mean, that's what parents thought right away. Like, Sam, what did you do? Mm -hmm. That's what police thought. That's what seemingly everyone thought. Sam killed Julie and yeah. went on the run. Now, there's various reasons on why they could think that. One of being potentially the PTSD from his time in service. Yeah. Yeah. And he had a criminal history. So things weren't looking good, especially considering like, okay, if a husband or wife dies, it's the, the other person that's usually – Suspect number one. It is. Yeah. So she's found in Sam's apartment. It's like he's that role right then and yeah. there. Man, I mean, I don't like neither of them needed to die whatsoever, obviously. But for him to also go about taking Julie's life seems that, like next level, really. Yeah. Because I like he could have easily he could have gotten away with it without also needing to kill her. I mean, he didn't get away with it either way, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. What, you, what you're basically saying is he went above and beyond and why. Yeah. It was unnecessary. Both were unnecessary, <laughs> but it's just, okay, you unnecessarily killed one and then you unnecessarily killed another. Yeah. It's like, how far are you going to just go for a couple bucks? And it seemed like both of these individuals- are pieces of shit. Um, well, no, right. Sam and Julie. Oh, okay, not them. Like, I was talking yeah, about Dan and we're Raquel. Like amazing, wonderful people. Yeah. And now they're gone. Yeah. Because Dan was broke. Because Dan is literally a disgusting piece of shit. Oh, he's a douche canoe for sure. I don't think oh. I've said that word for a while. He's a douche canoe. A massive douche canoe. <sighs> Big time. Time is like a hundred. <laughs> no kidding. Um, but yeah, that was the episode. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. I'm curious how you guys did on trying to navigate and follow the actual evidence. Nicole did really good. You right away picked up on on those text messages. She's like, that, that doesn't sound like Sam. Yeah. So good on you for that. I know, but then I did say, unless it was like an inside joke that I didn't know about, but that just seems so random that someone yeah. would be like, no sex, yeah. but I need to talk to you, but we're actually friends. Like it just is so, so random. Yeah, definitely. So. So. Wow. That story is kind of devastating. Isn't it? It, mm. it kind of broke my heart uh, researching this one. No kidding. I felt really bad for Sam, especially because like not only was, yeah, he had a criminal, criminal history. But then he went and he turned his life around uh, de being deployed and servicing his country and then uh, going out and getting an education and making all these friends. And then Dan just pins these horrible things on him. Yeah. 
So it's like the last thing that could have, thankfully it's not, but the last thing that could have been his legacy in his life was that he murdered Julie when he was just trying to be a good person. Yeah. Brutal. So thankfully Dan was found out for the piece of shit he is. Mm -hmm. And at least, at very least, Sam's name can be clean because he deserves that. He deserves so much more. Well, I mean, he, Dan's name was found out and like this was found out because he couldn't he couldn't hold it in though too mostly like oh. i mean maybe investigators would have come to this but like he couldn't hold it in no no he couldn't hold it in he just he spilled thankfully yeah hmm. anyways if you guys want to check out more of our socials like patreon where you can get more of these episodes they're all linked down below if you want to watch this the video version of this where i'm doing hand gestures frantically <laughs> to the camera right now um, it will be live on YouTube in a few days following this. Um, I'm not too sure exactly what day. It depends on how long editing will be. Um, but in the few coming times, we'll try and get a schedule figured out. Mm -hmm. But it will be on YouTube. We have two channels down below. We have one, Wicked Life, which is our vlog, and Wicked and Grim, which is where the podcast will be posted. Both of those links are in the description. Awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. You guys are amazing as always. And until next time. Until next time. Stay wicked. Mm -hmm.